思いますはい、Welcome to the Legislators Lounge.、Um, today, we,、uh, our bill is House Bill 573, and we're going to talk about the medical use of cannabis. The host of the show today are myself, Jim Webb, and Brian Cherichello. And today with us, we have Senator John Ray Reagan, and we have、um, Donna, Representative Donna Schlachman. Welcome, Senator. Welcome, Representative. Thank you. Nice to be here. Nice to be here. Thanks for coming. And、um, so, HB 573, if you want to give us a little bit of a background about that particular bill, that would be, that'd be great. Well, 573 just got the, it, this is our fourth time to pass the therapeutic use of cannabis in both the House and hopefully in a couple of weeks in the Senate. And it passed with the biggest margin of the four times it's passed the House with.、Uh, I believe the vote was 286 to 64. So it was a, an 80% plus、uh, margin in favor of the bill. Right. And why do you think, you, you had mentioned it's been up a couple of times in the, in the past. Why do you think it's gotten so much support this time around? Is it people are just more educated about the subject? Well, I think there's a couple of things playing into this.、Um, it's passed before and it's been vetoed by the governor. So, we have a governor now who said if the right bill comes to her desk, she will sign it. So, I think that signals to the House and the Senate that it's worth working on this bill, that it's worth voting for this bill. And、um, we also know we've had polls out from UNH that said that 75, 79% of the people that were polled in New Hampshire support the therapeutic use of cannabis. So, there, you know, there are a lot of things going our way. We've also seen All of our surrounding states have passed legislation and enacted le legislation. So we are now the holdout in New England in terms of、um, going forward with this. We're also hearing a lot from、um, the medical community through patients about the fact that doctors are more and more, and nurses are more and more, saying quietly to their patients, try some cannabis.、Right. This may help. And so I think we're seeing a lot of things coming together at the right time. And we also have an excellent piece of legislation. There are a lot of people that voted for it this time that have voted against it in the past because they see some, that it's a tighter bill, it's a more restrictive bill, and they're more comfortable with what we put in place.、Right. We've heard a lot from in the news all the time the problems that other states are having. Some of their problems are because they've just legalized marijuana. And I want to be clear today that we're talking about the therapeutic use of cannabis. Legalization of marijuana for me is a separate issue. This is very much a patient, doctor, nurse issue. So,、um, but we, you know, we've seen that. They see a bill that addresses a lot of the legal issues that they're concerned about, and it's much easier for them to vote for it. I don't know if you've heard other things. No, no, I think that's a, that's a great observation that people are. Confusing, and even the media is confusing where you have legalized the use of cannabis by everyone, and they are thinking that we're going to do that. This is the same thing here, and it's not. It's a, it's a, this is a, a medical use、uh, for pain and other relief, and it has nothing to do with, with the recreational use of cannabis. Right. So, so it's a very limited scope here. Very、yeah. limited. And one of the things, you know, one of the beauties of being late into the game, so to speak, is that you get to look at what other states have done and where they may have、um, taken a misstep that has made it harder. And so the definition of the patients that are eligible、right. um, the, for this is very, very tight. 
it, we have a list of very specific um, disease processes or illnesses. And on top of the list of those qualifying, so we, we define a qualifying patient with a qualifying condition, on top of those restrictive qualifying conditions, you also have to have certain symptoms that go along with it. So you can't just have Crohn's disease, for instance, because Crohn's disease can be mild or it can be severe. So if you have Crohn's disease, the diagnosis alone won't get you this, this um, um, certification from a, a physician or a nurse. You have to have a, a level of pain. You have to um, have a certain symptoms such as nausea, um, inability to eat, wasting syndrome, um, those kinds of things. And, and um, if you have severe pain, you have to have also tried other medications and have them fail. And this is where the whispering among the medical professions go to their patients. They'll, they'll have failed and everything, and then they go, why don't you try marijuana? So um, go ahead. It looks like you want to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's a... So that's, you know, that's one of the really important, the, the important differences that we learned in this bill was tighten the eligibility. We do have an exception because you can't list every possible um, disorder or disease and in fact we've had patients that have come and testified that might not fit into any of those categories but if their doctor can then say they don't have this but they have this and go to the Department of Health and Human Services and say I'd like to certify this patient and this is why I've done the exam this is what I'm seeing this is why I think this is a good um, palliative uh, drug for them, then the Department of Health and Human Services will, will certify that patient outside of that very restrictive definition. So we've tried to we've tried to keep it tight, but we've also we're also very aware that there are a lot of people using it now therapeutically who might not fit that definition, and we certainly don't want to close out somebody who's already I, um, been, been helped. I'd like to jump in. I, I spoke to somebody today, as a matter of fact, and I was telling them I was doing the show today, and their response was exactly what you said um, I don't think marijuana should be legal and that's where they don't realize and this is part of the reason why we're doing this show is to educate the, the people as to what this bill's content really is and it's not going to legalize marijuana right. it's strictly to try to help people who may be terminally ill who may have some disease that the only relief they can get is from um, using cannabis and I actually read this entire bill today. Congratulations. <laughs> it took me all a little. All 26 pages. All 26 <laughs> pages. And that's, that's because it goes into quite into detail. And there's, there's quite a bit of information in this bill. And for instance, um, if somebody does qualify to use cannabis under this bill, they have to renew every single year. It's not like it, you get it once and you're good forever. Um, I think that was an excellent thing that was added to the bill because now if, if that patient passed away and they could possibly fall through the cracks, mm -hmm. you know, or there's, there's nobody there to look to see if they did or not. So the once a year thing, it, it's, 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 it would, in my belief would satisfy quite a few people as to uh, the thought that was put into this bill. Yeah, um, one of the things that you just reminded me is not only do you get certified by a physician that you've had a relationship with, so you can't just go to your doctor and badger your doctor so much, you know, or a doctor and say, you know, and that's been one of the problems in some of the states is they've got certain doctors that are just willing to see somebody once for two minutes look at their diagnosis and say, okay, I'll certify you. You have to have a, an established relationship with a doctor. You have to have a, a, a medical examination. They have to be able to document exactly why they're certifying you. Then you take this information and you have to apply to the Department of Health and Human Services and get an identification card. And you have to carry that card. And if you don't carry that card, you can, you can be subjected to a $100 fine. So, so this end, you know, we're trying to address some of law enforcement's concerns. So if they see somebody for whatever reason, they think they're just looking a little funny or whatever, and they stop them, and of course, they, you, police officers don't stop somebody unless they feel they have probable cause. So I just want to, you know. That's, but if that's they actually stop outlined them, in there, too. Yeah, it's outlined in there. If they stop them, the person can say, yeah, and they find they, they're carrying a couple of ounces of marijuana, the, they can say, let me see your card. And if you don't have a card, 
you can get arrested. Now, you, if you have a card and you left it at home, you won't get convicted if you're a card-carrying certified qualified patient, but it's, there's a lot on the person that's using this to be responsible about it. You cannot drive under the influence any more than you could drive under the influence of any other drug. So um, that's part of the pages you read. Well, yeah, and another, another big one is, is that if you do misuse this, you, you, would be, um, you could be charged with a Class B felony. Right, if you, you can't sell it. You can't give it to somebody. You can't, you know, absolutely not. It's, it's there for, like any other medication. It's not, a, it's, an, a, it's not a medicine, per se. I mean, you can call it your personal medicine, but it is, you know, we, we relabel the, the bill therapeutic use of cannabis, cannabis being the scientific name, to separate it out from marijuana, which is the slang name. Um, that, so it's a therapeutic use of this plant, and it's therapy, we can't call it medicine because our medicines are approved by the FDA right. and we haven't gone, they haven't done that yet. Right. Wish they would do that. So, what, so I want to, to, to leave the, the imagined what will happen if uh, several of us, Representative Schlockman, myself, and uh, Senator, Stiles. Senator Stiles and Representative Wright, uh, and Emerson, yeah. we, we took a road trip and we drove to Portland, Maine to, vin to visit their cannabis dispensary oh. and uh, Maine has authorized eight dispensaries and one company uh, purchased four of the licenses and they operate four stores and um, what we learned was what we learned from the folks in, in, in uh, Maine was that all the things that everybody's so afraid of happening don't happen right they just don't happen the lady who was the executive director of the four stores said she had come here from California where she had worked in the same field and she said I have to tell you in California we did everything wrong right and he, she said and we came to Maine and we did everything right okay. so we've kind of modeled a lot of changes in the bill off of what we observed in Maine right right um, and one of the things that we were kind of disappointed in our field trip is we saw where it's dispensed. We saw where people can come in and get counseled as to, given your symptoms, this is what we, how you, we think you should take it. We didn't get to see where they grow it because they had an off-site thing. In this bill, you can only grow it in a locked, secure grow site. So I remember talking to some rep and they said, oh, we're going to have fields of marijuana, we're going to see farms with barbed wire fences up all over the place. That is not this bill. It has to be a secure, locked grow facility. And it has to be climate, climate controlled. Uh, I mean, yes, this it's very hard to grow marijuana. And in fact, one of the problems that Maine's just had, and I, I think some of your listeners might be going, oh, wait a minute, Portland, Maine, I just read something in the newspaper about them. They actually had a problem with one of their growth sites. They were using pesticides. Oh. And they were being a little sloppy about, how, about people coming in and out making deliveries and the door being open and, you know, some contamination going on. And so they got shut down by the, by the oversight department after there were some complaints. So we actually have in our law that you have to grow pretty much using organic, non-pesticide methods because the, these, these plants are very subjected to fungus and, and other things and so it's, it's really hard, which is why the other piece that we have in this, we do have, we've had, let's see, the Senate bill um, last term was a, a grow your own only, no alternative treatment centers. This has both options in it and um, for, for two reasons. One is we found out it's pretty expensive to get it from a, an alternative treatment center. Um, their, their prices were not that different than black market prices, which means that it's about $400 an ounce. And that's not very much for people who are um, using it for chronic pain or nausea or whatever their thing is. It's, it's not a huge amount. Um, so we were concerned with that First of all, that would be too expensive for some people. Secondly, right. and you have alternative treatment centers, and we're only allowing five in the state. Right. You live up in Coas County, 
there may not be one up in Coas County, given the population base. These things are not inexpensive to set up and oversee and, and, and grow. So we wanted to make sure that people had an alternative, so we were making sure there was access and that the access was affordable. The other thing is that it's going to take a couple years, once this bill goes through, for a center to go be up and running. Right. Um, just looking at all the other states that have done it, it's taken up to two years just to open the center. So we, we passed the bill, it's now legal, and then we're saying to patients, oh, but we have to still be criminals for the next two years because you, you, we have to wait till a center opens and then you can get your, your legal cannabis. So we have that self-grow um, piece in it, which we're hoping will make it through again. One of the things the main people learned from the street dealers was the street dealers were relieved to see that this was happening because they, the street dealers had their patients that they were caring for and right. trying to provide guidance to. And they said, you know, there's a lot of people need this that won't come and buy it from us because we're street dealers, we're criminals. Right. So they, they avoid us and they said, we're glad to see because we know from our current customers, we know how much relief they get from it and we're like glad to see that other people will be, have access. Right. So, and you um, also have when you when you, when you have a controlled area, like um, for instance, you'll be controlling the grow. There's no pesticides. There's no mold. There's no bacteria. Right. It's it's a instead of helping and the street side of it may actually be hurting you because who knows what's being cut right. down with and added or added to it just to give it weight. The, the dealers admit to that too. The dealers say we don't know when we get it. We have no quality measurement. Now in the industry because there is an industry now that supplies the, the medical side of this. And they have methods now to gauge the quality and the strength of the different cannabis products. And, there's, uh, and smoking is not what anybody's aiming for. It's not considered the most desirable way to do it. Right. Um, but uh, vaporization is, and there are tinctures, and there are you can cook with it. You can cook with it. Yeah. Right. Have but some, but for brownies. some patients where if it's very severe, quick onset pain, I spoke to somebody the other day um, who said his wife is going through chemotherapy and it's, the side effects are really horrible and she found two quick puffs and it takes away the pain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in that sense, two quick puffs, you want to, but I know there's been a lot put out there that um, it's, it's worse than smoking cigarettes, it, you know, it's causing cancer and it compromises the lungs. We're not advocating that people smoke, as, as um, the senator just said. It's, it's not the best, the healthiest way. For some people, though, who are only going to do two puffs a couple of times a day, that might not be an issue and they might be fine with the risk level of that smoke in their lungs. But there is vaporization. Back in the uh, mid-1800s, doctors used to give their patients tinctures of cannabis mm -hmm. to take care of um, pain and other illnesses. So. Right, right. Let's talk about some of the medical conditions that people would qualify under um, for therapeutic uh, cannabis. Well, right. Pain has to be number one. Pain, right. Uh, glaucoma has been treated with, with cannabis for and what's it do for glaucoma? I've, I've heard that, but I, I, glaucoma is just kind of like a the pressure, hazing. Yeah. Oh, I, it's a pressure I actually, thing. Okay. I actually don't know, but it's one. <laughs> it's funny. It's one of those things that they actually have some medical data on the relief of glaucoma. So I don't know. Do you know? I don't know it's enough a, about it's, glaucoma. It's an eye. Pr it's a, yeah. an eye pressure thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. With the blood vessels. But the the build has cancer, glaucoma, positive status for um, HIV. Um, well, HIV, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, hepatitis C currently receiving antiviral treatment. So you can't just be HIV positive. You actually have to be on a treatment regimen. Right. Um, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. I, I don't know anybody who doesn't know somebody who has died from that disease. Um, muscular dystrophy, Crohn's disease we talked about before. Agitation of Alzheimer's degree, disease. Uh, multiple sclerosis, chronic pancreatitis, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, the thing about PSTD, though, if that is the primary diagnosis, you also have to have a psychiatrist certifying the need for it. 
again, it's one of those things where there's lots of variations of PSTD. So we're not just, you know, you can't just say, oh, I was in the service, I have PSDT, I, I need this stuff. Right. You have to go and get a psychiatric evaluation and certification. Hmm. So, um, so those are the, med you asked about medical conditions. Right. And then, um, do you want to hear the and? Absolutely, okay. sure. <laughs> so, and a severely debilitating or terminal medical condition or its treatment that produces at least one of the following. Um, loss of appetite, chemotherapy-induced anorexia, wasting syndrome, severe pain that has not responded to previously prescribed medications and or surgical measures for more than three months. We kind of talked about that a bit or for which other treatment options produce serious side effects, constant or severe nausea, moderate to severe vomiting, seizures, or severe and persistent muscle spasms. Those, la the last things I mentioned, if you look at the, the painkillers and the drugs that are used to right. treat a lot of diseases, you know those ads that they go, and side effects could be blah, blah, blah. Right. Those are, side effects are common to a lot of medications that doctors use to treat really serious illnesses. Right. Which is why they're whispering. Table. <laughs> well, many of us. Well, I, I, it's like as you said, you don't know somebody who had ALS. Um, everybody knows somebody. I personally know somebody who passed away from it, uh, as as well as cancer. Cancer is just everyone sees the cancer and the chemo. And um, personally, I've had three family members pass away of cancer already, and my twin sister has it. And, you know, if you can give a, a cancer patient even 10 minutes of relief, uh, who should be saying no? I just, I, that's the way I look at it, and, you know, and, and I, I can't see why anybody, especially if it's so well controlled as this bill will do. Mm -hmm. Well, so the people that are saying no, we met some of them the other day. We were at uh, a, a gathering at Elliott Hospital where they had a lot of administrators and some physicians and we know from the testimony of um, uh, Dr. Savage who, who handles pain throughout the state, she's one of the premier pain people, so we know from the medical perspective there's a lot of concern about this. And I understand it because, because doctors are used to being in control and they're used to being in control of the pain management of their patients and they're used to having these protocols that say if you use this drug you use it for these diseases and you use it in this dose and you use it for this amount of time this is territory they don't know anything about this puts in the patient's hands more than the doctor's hands the control of pain management that is not a comfortable place to be they had said to us essentially if the FDA would approve it and if we knew how to prescribe it we'd be fine with it. And that's why, the, in fact, the FDA has approved H, uh, THC containing THC. drugs, which if you talk to patients, they have side effects. They don't work as well. They make them sick. So obviously, the part of the medical world has recognized that the THC in cannabis, the active ingredient that relieves pain, works. And, they, and so it works. Okay, we'll put it in a pill. The pills are costly, the pills don't work, but they've recognized it. Now why the FDA has not done real studies on this is, is beyond, it, is what, beyond belief? It makes no sense. They've, they've, they, years ago they actually had a program where they were, pres they were giving right. marijuana to patients under compassionate care. Was it the FDA was running that, wasn't it? Do you remember? It's the one that Irv Rosenfeld is in? It may have been. And so they had a bunch of patients who qualified who they were doing this. They were growing it at the University of Tennessee in Oxford. They're still growing it because they still have a few patients that are still alive after 30 years. Right. Right. Now, they missed an opportunity. And I think the states are saying to the federal government, you missed your opportunity. We've got patients. We've got people who need this. We're not going to wait anymore. Right. So. Well, we currently have 18 st states that have legalized this yeah. for medical use, and um, with 18 states already doing it, it's New Hampshire um, should be really looking. And, and we, we're not the, you know, of course, like you say, nobody wants to see the California or the Colorado. It is, you know, the mom and pop uh, thing where they have the, like the candy jars. You see them on the news. You see, we're full of, you, see them on the news. you know, and, and that's what everybody is looking at. And, and we want that what they need to really um, do. Like, you can go to our website, um, 
DairyLounge.com, and I actually have the bill number, and it's right on our web page. If you click on it, you can read the 26 pages. It, it'll come up. It's a link right to the bill, so it'll come up. So if people want to be more informed to as what this actual bill will do, it's on the website. Um, so you were just speaking about the federal FDA, and, uh, and I have a, a question with regards to the FDA and the feds, since we know that the federal government has not legalized right. this. If this bill was to pass in New Hampshire, do we, uh, are we going to have to worry in that the feds are going to be coming? Okay, so here's, here's how we understand it is, that the Justice Department has told their agents, which there are hundreds of thousands of federal police agents in the country, and they've told them in states that have laws controlling the medical use of cannabis that they're to leave those people alone. That oh, the states are entitled to their experiment and everybody should be interested to see how successful this is. So that's where that is with the federal intervention. So they're not going to be arresting people who are using cannabis that have medical conditions and have a letter of, of recommendation from their doctor. So, Which is also a very, I'm glad you said it that way, because that's a strong <coughs> argument for making sure that we have the self-grow piece of it, because we don't have any assurances that they won't close down um, our alternative treatment centers. They haven't done that yet with ones that are complying and ones that are clearly not in diversion, it, you know, there aren't diversions issues, but, but I know that, um, I think it was Delaware stopped its process of certifying because they were, the governor was told, we're not promising you that we won't go after them. We're not, you know, so I believe it's Delaware. Um, so that, you know, that is a concern. You just, we're not completely sure. And I think this is part of the reason why law enforcement is not happy with this bill because they already are dealing with the diversion of so many prescription drugs. They're already dealing with serious addiction problems for, with opiates and with um, heroin and meth and all that stuff. So they don't want to see anything that, that their concern will increase addiction. But again, again, I have to say this to law enforcement people, again, please understand we're talking about carving out a place for patients. And it's a very, it's very few. What was the, the number was, um, I think there was estimate under, under 1,000 people. 836 like, or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. In, Small in amount Maine, of which is, which is half the population of New Hampshire, they have, I think they it may, it may have passed 7,000 patients at this point. They have 4,000 people who have letters of recommendation who are served by the Grow Your Own people who they title caregivers. Right. So the caregiver can be a patient and can take care of five other people and can have six plants per patient. Okay. And in Maine, they don't register any of this. The users, are, the users have their letter of recommendation so that when they're transporting it home, right. if they're stopped, They've got, that's it. Right. There, there's, there's nothing said about it. But they've been very successful, and they've had no pushback from law enforcement in Maine. Wow. And because how, it's been so, they, they've handled it so well, right. and so well controlled. Right. How long has Maine had that on the they've books? They've had self-growth since 1999. So they just wow. opened their dispensaries in 2009? 2009. Yeah. But, you know, you, you hear those numbers, and you go, oh, my gosh, they've got 7,000 patients? And I'm thinking our estimates were we're going to have under 1,000. But, again... You don't register in Maine. It's a much more open eligibility. You know, it's the, and in spite of that, as the senator said, they're not. Law enforcement is not having a problem with patients. Right. The the, the manager of the dispensary we were in said that it was very interesting that the chief of police of the city of Portland came to to visit her. And he, and he said, I'm just here to tell you that if you see people lurking in your parking lot, call us because it's not, they're not police officers uh -huh. anymore. <laughs> he said, we've watched you very closely for this first year, right. and we're 100% satisfied that there's no diversion, 
there are no problems here. So he said, that's what I wanted to tell you. If you see somebody out there, don't assume it's, it's us. It's not us anymore. Right. Wow. So in, the, in, the, in that previous, in that first year, they recorded 54 armed robberies of pharmacies for oxys. And in right. the dispensaries, they had zero robberies. Right, right. Which leads me to say, I mean, with pres legal prescription drugs, that's where the real big issue is, you know. It's well, they're, you know, they're highly dangerous. They're highly addictive. Um, you know, the, it's not a joke, but it almost sounds like a joke, like how many people have died from uh, an overdose of marijuana? Right. Right. Exactly. None. None. There was one death I heard of, I think, in California from a user um, who, there was a pesticide. It was a pesticide issue. It was wow. a poisoning of the pesticide. So. Wow. Um, yeah, but you hear all the time about deaths from currently prescription opiates. There were between 1997 and 2004, 10,000 deaths attributed, primarily attributed to 17 prescription drugs. Wow. There have been no deaths that could be primarily attributed to cannabis. To cannabis. Wow, that's, that's a real important uh, so fact. one of the questions we asked in Maine was, we said, well, you hear so much about a gateway drug, that's all, you can't talk to a police chief that he doesn't start yelling it's a gateway drug. Right. So the woman said, that's very interesting, we did find out it was a gateway drug, and we found out from the people that come here and from talking to the street dealers, and they said, thank God this, that we can readily get cannabis, because it's the gateway for us to get off of cocaine, heroin, meth. It was the it was the escape gateway right. for them to be off of hard drugs. Huh. So we said, well how did that how does that occur? What and they said um, what happens on the street, it, you find somebody to supply your habit and you go there week after week or whenever you, a payday or whatever you go and you buy whatever. And one day you go and they say, gee, you know, I don't have any I don't have any marijuana today, but <laughs> Right. <laughs> Why don't you try this? And and that's what these people told them that that's how they that's how they right. got diverted from marijuana into cocaine or heroin or right. meth or whatever it happened to be. And they said now that we have a regular source, we're able to stay off of really hard drugs. Not at risk, yeah. And we're not out knocking people over the head, and we're not right. robbing stores. We're, we're able to afford this. This is affordable, so we're able to maintain our habit right. and, and still go to work every day. Right. So they were, these people that were, that the cannabis rescued them from a life of hard drugs and robbery and assault, and right. huh. it made a difference in their lives and all the people that they're not robbing. Right. Mm, that's interesting. I, I, when, in reading the bill, I also noticed there's another section in here for... Um, the, the bill itself primarily is for New Hampshire residents, although it's, although it will be on, will honor other states that have been approved, I believe. No, the original bill did have um, uh, sections on um, visiting designated patients, and and the and we cut we cut that out okay. um, because we were concerned that it would open the door to some level of diversion. I don't know that we were so concerned, but law enforcement was certainly concerned. Um, if there's someone from Maine who has some written thing from a doctor saying they're an eligible patient and they visit somebody in New Hampshire, they can bring two ounces with them as long as they are carrying something that shows they're a patient and they will be protected under our law as a visiting patient. If they run out, they cannot resupply in our state. Originally, we, we thought they could go to a... a um, yeah, that, uh, that's what I was getting at when I was reading yeah, it, that, that no, they cannot purchase it. An out-of-state no. person cannot there, there purchase a it. There was a lot of trepidation about the interstate exchange of, of drugs, and that's what drove that out of the bill and other bills. As okay. the, the advice becomes, you know, the legal advice becomes, why don't you just stay away from people in other states and yeah, it makes until, sense. Until, until, until the federal government get sane and right. decides to allow people to use this. But if somebody's from another state and they're feeling good, they're not throwing up, they, wow, you know, I can take a vacation, I can go to New Hampshire, they, you know, be nice if they could also carry this with them so that they continue to feel good while they're here. So the, the two ounces is, is the limit, which is really the, the only amount that even a qualifying New Hampshire patient is allowed to carry on them outside their home. Cool. 
So by way of background, an ounce of marijuana will get you 28 cigarettes. Okay. So for the people that, there are, apparently there are a lot of people who, for pain relief, light up that same cigarette two or three or four times a day, take a couple of puffs, put it out. Right. So the ounce in the 28 cigarettes will pretty much carry them for a month. Right. So. Yeah, the bill says if you're going to an alternative treatment center to purchase your product, you can um, get, um, I think it's two ounces every 10 days is the most that you can get. Is it two or is it one? I have it. Two. I think it's two. It can be two. Yeah. In these centers, you had mentioned there's going to be five. That's that'll be the maximum. Five max. Right. And then what's that process? I mean, how does I mean, what's the screening for that? Here's what happened in Maine. They, they, they wrote the rules. So we'll have to write rules for when the when the statute's enacted. We'll then have to write the rules that will tell that the Department of Health and Human Services, who will be the the watchdog of this, and that'll that'll set up they'll set up the process for bidding to open a an alternative treatment center. Okay. So there'll be a fee involved, okay. and we'll have to set the fee because w and that will be determined by how many payroll dollars we need at DHHS to pay the inspector and the person that who's supervising the registration campaign for the identification cards right and that will that will determine that amount of money and then uh, people will have to demonstrate that they are able to do this that they have the financial backing and they'll have to verify who their board of directors are they are forced to be a nonprofit organization and what another thing we learned in Maine were people came forward and helped them finance the opening of these dispensaries. Oh. So the one store we were in, they said they spent $250,000 to renovate what they use as their pharmacy and set up their growing operation, which is right. not all that elaborate, but it has to be weatherproof and it has to have electricity and, and it has to be secure. Right. No, yeah, I, so. I see the bill has a fiscal note. Is that what the fiscal note covers? Is the the uh, administration costs? The, the, the fees that they set that the senator was talking about have to cover all the costs of our Department of Health and Human Services. So this bill doesn't have a fiscal note on it per se in terms of it's going to require funding from the state in any way. It's it's they're gonna they're gonna have to raise their own funds whether it's privately or how you know but the but anything that DHHS has to do they will set the fees to cover so so that the ID cards are going to cost something and certainly there's going to be registration fees for these centers and fees for licenses in these centers and so I don't, no. I don't know what those will be they'll have to figure out the staff ID, wise the ID much. cards now I, I read it goes in quite detail as to what the ACE IDs are random numbers letters and all that and what has to be on this card and then there'll be a database that collects this information and if a police officer for instance believes that you might be growing it in, in, in your home or something he'll be able to check before he goes breaking your door down with a warrant because it'll be you'll have to register that you are a home grower or so right. so forth um, my question as far as that goes are these these actual cards I mean who's going to have access to that information well, that's why it's the, the random, the seven-digit randomized number, or whatever it is, is because there, there are privacy. The HIPAA Privacy Act is, is applies to the privacy of these patients. So DHHS has access to its database, and it, will, and it uses that database to track what's happening, but nobody has access to that except if, if the police, uh, law enforcement shows cause for wanting to know, is that house on that street? A certified grower because we're aware that you know they seem to have something going on and then they can call DHHS and DHHS can say yes that's a certified grower so but, they, but but if they feel that okay they know a certified grower needs a special room and it has to be locked in their house and they can only have up to you know six plants or is it three, three. plants? Three, three plants sorry three we right. changed it from six to three plants and they can only have this much space and we think they've got you know 
200 square feet of something going on, then they can, they can get their warrant. Right. Even though DHHS has said that's a growth site, if they have enough evidence for themselves to know there's more than a personal small growth site here, they can issue their warrant. And that person, even if they have a card, if they have gone over the amount, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. <laughs> and will they share this information with local police, uh, the registration information? No, no, they, they can call and say, oh, I have reason to suspect that at the Schlockman residence they're growing marijuana. Is that legitimate? And they can verify that it is or it is not. Okay, but the local police would not have they're database not share, to... No. Okay. That's privacy. Okay. Yeah, I mean, right, they don't know who's got a prescription for Oxycontin. Right. Again, you mentioned the HIPAA laws. Right. Oh. Right. There was a piece in the in the bill that talked about the distance of pre-existing uh, private schools and public schools. Thousand feet. Which is important because I think a lot of people would. Right. People need to know that these, if they are doing it, it's not going to be close to the school. Not going to be close to a sc an existing school. And the other thing is that um, that communities, if they want, if there's a concern, they can have a hearing. You know, a public a public hearing. Where, where DHHS and the governing body of the community and people and neighbors and whomever can come and sit and say, this, you know, this is what's planned, and they can voice their concerns and figure out at the end whether they have enough concern. Which brings up a really good point. I, I was on the planning board many years ago, so one of these centers, would they have to go in front of a planning board for an allowed use, because this is something I that's would, brand new. It's a retail operation. Yeah, so, okay. so whatever. So if you have... A, planning boards that doesn't want a retail operation, right. you might have a problem. Right. This fit right you know, if you're looking for a, a, a solid business, you know, this is a daytime, not open Sunday operation right. that doesn't have a lot of traffic. Right. There's, there's not a lot. For the, for the hundreds of people that access the Portland dispensary, we were there for half a day, and there was like always somebody coming in the door, but there were never two people right. at a time in there. And because you only go, you only shop this once a month. Right. And you wouldn't actually know it was there. I mean, the growth site wasn't there, but just right. in terms of traffic, which is the point, right. um, it was. This was in the back in back of a restaurant. a restaurant. So there was it was off a parking right. lot and. It wasn't obvious. I mean, I would figure the, the most logical place would be in a high populated area so many people can get to it. This like was, a Manchester or. This oh, was very close to the Maine Medical Center. Yes. Yeah. This was, this was yeah. within a short walk of the Maine Medical right, Center. Right, right. Huh. Yeah. And, and there was another piece of the bill that said qualifying patients who could not afford it. Is there a provision in the bill that helps people, low-income people? Dispensaries need to have, a, in, their, in their plan, they need to sort of address how they would accommodate people who, who are low-income. And we asked that question in Maine, and they said they do have a, a, a scale. So they do huh. try Sliding to. Sliding scale. Yeah, they do try to help people. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So you might be interested to know that last year in New Hampshire, we spent... Ninety-four million dollars on prescription drugs, just for Medicaid patients. Wow! Wow! So, um, some amount of those ninety-four million dollars would hopefully be reduced by the use of therapeutic cannabis, because it does reduce your dependency and need for so many opiates. Right, and there's studies I would imagine that point to that fact. Well, the, the, here's well, the other thing: is the, the drug companies have managed to keep this a big secret because they don't want the competition. Because you can't patent cannabis; it's a plant. Right. It's a plant. You can't patent a plant right. unless you invented it yourself. Right. So they're not eager to have people find out how effective this is. So what we pointed out at the at the Elliott Board of Directors meeting to the docs there were you're going to do your own research because your patients are going to come to you and they're going to tell you how this is working for them. Right. And you're going to tell your colleagues and that's how this will grow very rapidly. Right. So. The, the people that, that I've heard from who are most enthusiastic about this are the nurses who work in pain clinics or who work in hospice. And I spoke to one nurse who's up north and so she's, um, she's in a clinic that serves New, uh, New Hampshire residents and Maine residents and she called me 
because she wanted me to know that her patients from Maine are doing much better with their pain management than her New Hampshire patients, and she has been able, this speaks to the point just made, she's been able to reduce their, their prescription drugs. So it's not only are they doing better for themselves, but they're also lowering their costs. Right. Huh. And that's, that's a really important reason right. to pass this huh. bill. Very and good. the other interesting thing is that Oxyco Oxycontin, over the years, has been prescribed more and more just for straight pain, where it came out originally to deal with the side effects, I believe, of, of um, cancer-related pain and stuff. I don't know if that was its original reason, but if you right. look at oxy um, cotton used for cancer, oxy cotton used for just pain without cancer, the pain piece is increased and increased and increased, which says something about our overuse, our overdependence, our addiction. Right. Well, it's, it's also something that the doctors then have a greater handle on because they, they <clears throat> started out prescribing it for so many people with cancer. And, and then they began to learn the tolerance that the patients had for their other pain patients. So once the pain, the pain people learn about it, um, your, all your oncologists become default pain specialists. So. Well, you, you'll see certain drugs that were designed for one thing and prescribed for other things. And, right. and I think um, that that's a common thing uh, where I know for so, in some cases they're actually given antidepressants for pain, for mild pain, for nerve pain and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure that the, um, the industry doesn't want to see um, cannabis used more because it might be found to be even more uh, relaxing and help, helping patients and, and is a huge industry, a lot of money. But getting into industry, yes. I, will, I will say that I, when I read the bill, I see that you protected the insurance companies by saying that they are not required to cover this under well, an insurance it's policy. It's not a prescription drug. That's right. It isn't. And, um, it's a, and it's, it's still a federally outlawed yeah. right. drug. Yeah. And, and you also protected them for that, you, you know, it doesn't mean you can bring it to work and smoke it neither, because if your employer is going to want let you smoke it, you're going to need a permission and all that. Right. So That's, you did protect employee, yeah. employers. And, and landlords as well. The, you know, the, the tenant needs the landlord's permi permission if, you, if, the, if the person lives in a no-smoking apartment building, then they, they, um, they could vaporize it but they need the landlord's permission. Mm. The, the property owner needs to say it's okay. The employer needs to say it's okay. That doesn't mean that they can operate machinery while impaired, you know? Right, and it actually goes into detail about that, that you'll still be, you know, you can't do something under the influence of, right. a, of this or any other drug, right. just like it would be any other drug. Yeah. So, one of the other hats I legislatively on one of my 10 statutory committees that I'm a member of is the Suicide Prevention Council. So as I studied what went on in the, in the world of suicide prevention, found a study that in states that have more relaxed prohibitions about marijuana have fewer suicides oh. because they have fewer patients severely depressed and and they're able to reduce their number of alcohol addicted right patients and then people who are who are alcoholics they were able to cut back on their use which reduces their depression and reduces their their motivation for so suicide. Right. Well, that's interesting. interesting yeah. it is interesting. Let's talk about the uh, advisory council. I know you've got something set up in there. Yes, we put in an advisory council for this um, that is going to report to the health care oversight committee um, at DHHS on a yearly basis. And this um, advisory council is made up of pretty much all the stakeholders you could possibly imagine. So it's got law enforcement, it's got medical people, it's got legislative people, it's got hospital people, it's got, I don't know, it's about 20 people. Um, I can, I can <laughs> so see really if I can find well the all list. Encompassing, huh? yeah. <coughs> and, and, and it's charged with really, really overseeing how is it going, right. who are we reaching, how many people are we reaching, um, the, the ATCs have to, the alternative treatment centers have to report into them on an annual basis. 
Um, so we, you know, we really want to use this to also learn right. more about what we're doing and how best we can do it. And then every five years, or after five years, the council needs to sort of look at this and say, how's it go working? Is it going? Do we so, so we actually have a sunset clause yeah, in the bill. Well, no, it's not a sunset clause, no. and I'm glad you brought that up because okay. we really talked about that. There were some reps that said, look, I can vote for it, but if you put a sunset in, I can. I, I want to vote for it. If you put the sunset in, I will vote for it because if you don't do it, I can't vote for it because I have constituents that hate this. Right. But think about it. You pass a law, you say to me, I can use this legally now to manage my pain, and in two years, we may take it away, or an alternative treatment center, which you've right. heard is not an easy thing to set up that business. There's a lot of cost involved in that. And you say to them, set it up, and in two years, we'll let you know whether we're going to close your doors. So we right. thought, no. There's no incentive. We, and we have, we have evidence from around us that says there's no reason why we would shut this down. But in five years, we certainly may want to look at how well it's working. Do we want to increase the amount? of ATCs, do we want to reduce the amount? Do we want to, you know, right. what, what do we want to do? So there's a, the Attorney General's designee, the Department of Safety's designees, Health and Human Service designee, nurse practitioner, representative from a community hospital, the ACLU, a qualifying patient, um, someone from the Board of Medicine. So it really, it wow. covers a lot, and then, uh, the, and it really is. You know we love our committees. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. The legislature, we, we, it's hard to find anything that doesn't deserve having a committee for it. We <laughs> want to make sure that not only have we passed the ba best law, but that if it's not absolutely the best, if there's something we learn along the way, we have an avenue to make changes. Right. Now, this is a quite intensive bill. Uh, is this just done this year, or is this one that's been presented in past years? And this just is a kind combination of, of the past two, last year's, last term and the terms before it. Last term was just a self-grow, the, the one before it was just alternative treatment centers. Put those together, and then tweak, 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 tighten, 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 tighten. So, so the 80% vote in favor of it proved the effectiveness of the process. Huh. So. So we know that the governor um, would support it under certain circumstances. We know that the House has passed the bill 286 to 64. So the million dollar question I'm going to ask Senator Reagan is, what does he think is going to happen in the Senate? This would be the fourth time for the Senate to pass it. They, and they have in the past? Well, they always have. The, the legislature's always passed it. John Lynch was always the roadblock. Okay, so the governor was always... It was the, always Governor Lynch that uh, blocked And I think we, we know we have at least 13 votes in the Senate. Right. We'd like to, it to go through veto-proof. If right. we have 16 votes in the Senate, right. the governor doesn't even have to yeah. think about it. That was a, a lot of great information today. Um, where do you think people, if they want to get additional information, are there any certain websites out there that they can go to? There are websites. I mean, if you just... If you just Google cannabis, you'll find a wealth of information. Yeah, well, good. So. Yeah. Um, we don't have a website for this bill. You have some links on your website. Well, I, put, I put a link right to the text um, of this bill on I, ours. I will take phone calls if anybody can spell my name. Actually, <laughs> actually, you don't even have to if you go to our website. Okay. And your picture is on our website. If they click on, on your picture, it'll bring you to your legislative page. Mm -hmm. And the same with you, Senator. Okay. So anybody wants to get a hold of you, they can click on the picture at dairylounge.com, which is on the screen. <laughs> and, and what it'll do is uh, it'll bring you right there as well as, as Brian's and mine. Uh, anybody's picture that I put up there, I usually put a, I make it a okay. link. So Great. when you pitch, Great. click on it. And it'll certainly, if there are patients out there who are unable to come to testify when it's in the Senate, and it'll be heard in the Senate, I believe the tentative date is the 11th yes. of April. Um, but if they can't make, hearings only go so far, and I, I don't want people to flood to the Senate because we the, don't. We, we, we there won't be enough time for everybody to testify. Right. But letters, letters to the, to the full Senate, full Senate or just your committee? Well, the full Senate, full Senate would, it, would yeah. be great. Good. Great. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we're running out of time here. Uh, came in a few minutes ago and told me. So um, I, I'd like to close with this. I'd like to thank you both for being on our show today. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank very you informational. For, thank you for producing the show, and your, your voters should be uh, very pleased to have 
two representatives that are making such an effort to bring them information. Right. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. And um, I'd like to say also that our next show is already scheduled, and the next show we'll be showing will be on House Bill 617. And um, Representative Campbell has already agreed to gas come on. Gas tax. And that's the, that's the 12 cent increase in the gas tax. So stay tuned and look at our webpage, and uh, we'll have more information. And thank you for being with us today. Great. Mm -hmm.